received news that my father-in-law has terminal cancer. He said, Since you're his son, you should figure out a way, even as a struggling working class couple. My sister-in-law didn't bother visiting or being present during his final moments. My father-in-law had something he desperately wanted to give me, but when he handed it over, I was handed something outrageous. Furthermore, my father-in-law said the following, There's one more thing that I've been hiding from you. My name is Linda and I'm 45 years old. I have been working as a part-time employee since my younger days. Chin at a caregiving facility, I became a full-time employee a few years ago, and I have been working there ever since. James and I grew closer after he received guidance during his early days, and we eventually got married after an office romance. Our only son is now a university student living on his own. He has become independent, and I have fully dedicated myself to my work now. My mother-in-law passed away a few years ago due to cancer. Then, one day, we received the news that my father-in-law also had terminal cancer, which was inoperable. I wonder if our family has a cancer-prone lineage. I should be careful, too. I listened to James murmuring like that, and we headed to the hospital. Wait, where's my sister? Seriously? Again? We met up with my father-in-law and entered the examination room to hear what the doctor had to say. Even though my sister-in-law Karen had been informed in advance by both James and me, on that day, she didn't show up for the doctor's discussion. When we later checked, we found that Karen had actually replied to the message. Why do we have to go and hear such things? Just leave your sister alone. It's pointless to say anything to her. Even so, your father-in-law is important. Maybe your sister-in-law just doesn't fully understand the situation. On that day, she didn't show up for the doctor's discussion. No, it's inconvenient for you to come all of a sudden. But Karen didn't let me into the house. Do you understand the reason for my visit? If so, at least listen to what I have to say. Perhaps it happened to be her day off today, but I could hear Karen's husband's voice from behind her, saying, just send that person away quickly. It was annoying. Despite the unpleasantness of Karen and her husband's attitude, I started talking about my father-in-law's illness in front of the entrance. If it's about that, I already heard it over the phone. Was it necessary to come here and tell me in person? Ken's words struck a nerve. I had intended to leave the matter to James since it was about my in-laws, but with the combination of her attitude, I couldn't help but speak up. Your words are quite something, considering you can say that to your own parent in a difficult situation. I don't want to deal with it. Didn't you work in caregiving? You're not suitable. Just do your best as a struggling dual-income couple. Despite my persistence and plea for at least a little help from her, she didn't budge. X resigned. I made my way back home. Take up. Just remember that there's not much time left for my father. Karen is a full-time homemaker, so we've planned to rely on her for daytime caregiving. Well, I found fulfillment in my job. I hesitated to quit as it meant giving up something valuable. However, with Karen rejecting the caregiving responsibility, that option was becoming precarious. That night, I found myself discussing it again with James. If Karen and the others won't participate in caregiving, it means we as a couple have to take care of it ourselves, right? I implicitly conveyed my intention to James that I wanted to take turns and participate in caregiving. Then James's eyes wandered, and he said, Linda, I'm sorry. I don't intend to burden you with my father's caregiving, but if I also become fully occupied with that, we'll be in financial jeopardy. I support our household financially, so can't we find a way to rely on others? Are you suggesting that I should give up my job that I worked so hard to become a full-time employee? That I should give up my that I worked so hard to become a full-time employee? Give up my? Did I work so hard to become a full-time employee? I'm sorry. So James's statement. I finally made up my mind. Got it. I can always return to work. But the time with my father-in-law is already limited, right? Leave it to me regarding my father-in-law. The next day, I explained the situation to my boss and offered to resign at the end of this month. I summon the Leticians. The problem was not just the caregiving. My father-in-law only had minimal insurance coverage and couldn't cover the miscellaneous expenses. I can't rely on Karen in that state, but my father-in-law frequently expressed his gratitude to me. Rather, it's me, the daughter-in-law, who should apologize. Please don't hesitate to tell me anything. When I said that, my father-in-law showed a relieved expression. On the first day of caregiving, I read a book and gave him a CD for my bookworm father-in-law. Thanks from that day on, I would complete the household chores every day and drive to the hospital, which took 30 minutes. James would also come to the hospital every day after work to check on my father-in-law's condition. 
My father-in-law never showed any signs of struggling with his treatment. However, as time passed, his condition deteriorated, and he had to start taking meals through a tube. Hey sis, dad doesn't have much time left. Really, can you come and see him, even just for a moment? Don't talk nonsense. What's the point of getting involved with someone who's going to die? Just because I'm a housewife doesn't mean I have nothing to do. James tried to convey the condition of my father-in-law to Karen several times, asking if she could come and visit, but he was turned down. Actually, eventually, James started finishing work early to come to the hospital. I tried to create time for James and my father-in-law to be alone together, so we spent our days killing time at the hospital store when James was around. My father-in-law told me something. One day, when we returned from the store, my father-in-law told me something. Linda, thank you always. Though it may be small, I want you to be the beneficiary of my insurance policy. So let's talk about this another time. Father-in-law, it must be difficult for you to speak, so let's talk about this another time. You know, I feel a bit at ease. Actually, I wanted to talk about it now. It was at that moment when my father-in-law said those words. At that very calculated timing. The hospital room door was rudely opened, and Karen walked in. Wait a minute. I can't allow someone else to be the beneficiary of the insurance. I absolutely won't let it happen. So, oh, can I leave only this insurance for Karen then? More easily than I had expected, my father-in-law yielded to Karen's words. I wasn't here for the money, but honestly, I thought Karen was being audacious. However, apart from the insurance money, let's give everything else to you and James as a couple. If Karen promises that she won't do anything for you, and James in exchange for receiving the insurance money, then that's fine. What are you saying? That's more than enough. Besides, there's no other substantial property anyway. Next Karen, who was supposed to have come to visit, left these words behind and quickly went home. As I watched Karen's back as she left, I couldn't help but feel puzzled and bewildered about why she had come to visit at this timing. History strange manner. While James was understandable, it was surprising to see my father-in-law laughing so innocently. It was somewhat unexpected. Karen fell for it completely. James said, I told her that there was an important matter from father, and I contacted you in advance. Sit. Karen, well, she didn't even come when our mother was critically ill. She's a troublesome daughter. My father-in-law said with a wry smile. Father asked me to bring this from our family home. James said as he handed a locked safe to my father-in-law. Quietly, my father-in-law opened it and took out a cash card from inside. He then handed it to James and me. This is the property other than the insurance money. I looked at the balance in the passbook and felt my legs go weak. Why? Why did you hide it all this time? I didn't have any money, and I didn't want to burden you both even more. I didn't want Karen to find out by us suddenly spending lavishly. After saying that, my father-in-law took a moment to catch his breath. The Lehman took- I wanted to give it to Linda who took care of me, despite my limited time left. Of course, since he's the eldest son, I'd always planned to pass it on to him from the beginning. Linda, thank you so much for being with me. As I listened to my father-in-law's heartfelt words of gratitude, my eyes welled up with tears. We had no reason to refuse, so we accepted the passbook from him. We informed Karen, but she never came to visit. That as my husband and I watched over him, my father-in-law suddenly opened his eyes. We have something important to tell you. Actually, there's one more thing I've been keeping a secret. Determined not to miss my father-in-law's final words, we approached him closely. In truth, my father was a famous writer. I was born out of wedlock, so nobody knows. Gradually, within my father-in-law's words, there was a quiet, strained breath mixed in. And my writer father left me a considerable fortune. My father-in-law mustered his last bit of strength and handed me a piece of notepaper. Um, butts on that paper. An unfamiliar address was written. However, it was evident that it was a town where affluent people resided. They will surely welcome you. With those words, my father-in-law closed his eyes slowly and peacefully drifted off to sleep. Until the end. Care didn't participate in his care or assist with the funeral arrangements. However, later on, when Karen found out that we had inherited a substantial fortune, she became furious. She broke the promise she made with my father-in-law and stormed into our home. This thief... It's not too late even now, so share it with us. In fact, consider it as compensation for all the trouble and hand it all over. You've never done anything for dad or mom all this time, so what right do you have to say anything? It's the pathetic insurance money? Who would be happy about it? You stay quiet. Don't even mention that pathetic insurance money. 
I must have become quite emotional. In that moment, James instinctively shielded me and ended up injuring his head. She was making suspicious movements while driving. The police stopped her and informed her that, that there had been a report filed. After a while, Karen resisted the police until the end, hurling verbal abuse. When the police told her, if malice is proven, your charges will become more severe. James had bleeding from his face, so it seems that it would be considered as an assault charge, rather than a physical injury charge. Even if he's not indicted, James was determined to pursue a civil lawsuit at the very least. Our long yet short journey through caregiving issues and inheritance problems has come to an end. After my father-in-law passed away, three months later, James and I arrived at the location mentioned in the final note we received. At that place, there stood a magnificent mansion. A woman came out from inside and escorted us to the living room. The woman explained that this mansion had belonged to my father-in-law. This person had been working as an assistant while my father-in-law resided in this house. She's been entrusted with the management of the mansion on a regular basis. After giving us a tour of the house, the assistant said, This is from your father-in-law. Seems like something out of a drama, doesn't it? When we opened the envelope, inside was a letter. The letter consisted of about two pages, and to summarize its contents, it stated that we were free to do as we pleased with this mansion. If Karen were to find out about this, we were uncertain about what she might do, so we firmly pledged to keep it a secret from Karen. After that, I returned to work, perhaps due to the shortage of caregivers. I have been surprisingly welcomed by my colleagues, which makes me happy. As for that house, we currently have no plans to use it as a residence. We intend to cherish it as precious memories with my father-in-law and protect together. And did you send up any $1,500 allowance? I wanted, I wanted the apartment. My mother is her terrible state. Dan's face turned red, revealing his anger. He was usually calm, so I couldn't hide my surprise. We have no money. The electricity and water have been cut off. She said she didn't want to worry me, so she kept quiet. And what happened to the $1,500? Uh, tell me the truth. My husband. Dan seemed concerned about his mother and was not thinking clearly. It seemed that his mother hadn't eaten either and looked worn out. How was it? I couldn't believe it and told Dan. Have you looked at your mother's bank book? You'll understand everything if you see it. I showed my husband the bank book and he started trembling. Plan B, first price grants. What's going on? Cost... Is it possible that my mother... No way, it can't be. My name is Anne. I work at a publishing company. Ever since I joined as a new employee, I have been looked down upon for being a woman. I was determined not to lose to men and work desperately, tirelessly. It wasn't until I turned 38 that I finally got assigned a project of my own. While my subordinates were getting married and leaving one after another, I would boast. I lived for my work. I enjoyed my job and it gave me a sense of fulfillment. In my younger days, I had my work. Every time I attended weddings of people around me, I would remind myself of that. I focused on my career, and it was painfully devoid of any romantic encounters. Every single day, it was just commuting between home and the office. I would start my day early, grabbing a cup of coffee at the office, and return home late after overtime, when it was already pitch dark outside. But once I arrived home, changed out of my suit into comfortable clothes, and enjoyed that refreshing feeling. A refreshing feeling was sipping a beer. I started thinking, who needs marriage anyway? During that time, I met a business partner named Dan. We were signed to work on a project together. Naturally, our relationship as work partners developed. Would you like to grab a meal together? Yes, absolutely. Even during our meals, work topics dominated our conversations. We started seeking each other's advice and gradually began having meals together on multiple occasions. Initially, our discussions revolved around work, but naturally shifted to discussions about our families. We talked about our mothers, fathers, and the environment around us. I learned that Dan's parents divorced when he was young and his mother raised him on her own. His mother apparently had aspirations of becoming an actress or a model in the past. Before I knew it, I found myself sharing about my parents' divorce and how my father raised me alone. I want to burden my mother, who supported me even through university, with financial troubles anymore. I understand. I feel the same way. I'm truly grateful to my father, and I always want to repay him with filial piety. Perhaps it was because our situations were similar, 
or maybe it was Dan's kindness and good nature. I started opening up my heart. Dan also shared something else with me. My mom and mother went through a period of deep emotional distress when she incurred a significant amount of debt. It still has some remaining debts, and we are paying them off together. Our beginning went off together. Dan's mother fell victim to a fraud scam. She was deceived and lost a large sum of money. Dan learned about this and has been providing her with a monthly allowance of $1,000 ever since. I was deeply moved by his kindness. For young professionals, $1,000 is a substantial amount of money. The fact that he was sending that to his mother every month left me in awe. I also didn't want to burden my father anymore. I strongly felt the need to repay him and show him that I was a good person. And show me gratitude. I we help an inspector. Hey, he's a curse man. It was a spontaneous remark driven by emotions. It might have been a complete reverse proposal. Maybe it was due to our age. However, with both of us being busy with work. But my words seemed to have struck a chord with Dan. Damn, will you marry me? You cast that. He proposed to me. And yes, let's repay our parents' kindness together. Let's create a happy family. I answered. And so, and became my husband. And my career was going well. Both our personal and professional lives were thriving. There were times when I had to work late, and Dan would cook dinner for me. We had the mindset that if one of us took care of the household chores, it would be sufficient, and supported each other. Initially, Dan was considering living with his mother, as he was worried about her. I agreed with the idea, but his mother said, enjoy your time together as a couple. So, we rented an apartment nearby, ensuring that we could be there quickly if anything happened and be readily available. The financial support that Dan used to provide before we got married increased to $1,500 per month. We both agreed on this amount and sent it to his mother regularly. I also wanted to give something back to my own father, perhaps a trip or a small gift. I also felt the desire to save money for a future child who might come along someday. But for now, our main concern was Dan's mother. We continued to support her financially, working together as a team. Immersed myself in my work every day, just as I did before. One day, upon returning home from work, Dan suddenly said to me, Anne, did you send the $1,500 allowance? While in the apartment, my mother was in a terrible state. These decisions turned red, revealing his anger. I respect. He was usually calm, so I couldn't hide my surprise. We have no money. He said she didn't want to worry me, so she kept quiet. And what happened to the $1,500? My husband. Dan seemed concerned about his mother and was not thinking clearly. It seemed that his mother hadn't eaten either and looked worn out. However, I couldn't believe it and told Dan, have you looked at your mother's bank book? You'll understand everything if you see it. Oh yeah, happy say. What's going on? Is it possible that my mother? No way, it can't be. Since the passbook had a record of the $1,500 transfer, it was evident that I had been sending the allowance properly. However, there were also some records in the passbook, and Dan seemed to realize the seriousness of the situation. It was understandable that he was distraught. I had also recently discovered something, and when I first saw it, I was deeply shocked. But little did we know that we were about to face an even greater shock. It all started with a phone call. The person on the other end was my father. He occasionally called me to check up on me, and during that phone call, by the way, recently, I saw Dan's mother. Upon hearing my father's words, I felt a chill run down my spine. You know that luxury apartment building near the station? I saw Dan's mother coming out of there. She was dressed casually. I thought she might be living there. Well, who knows? Ha <laughs> ha. I told my husband about what my father had said, and he immediately called his mother. However, no matter how many times he tried, there was no answer. The next morning, my husband and I went to the apartment building my father mentioned. It seemed to have more than 20 floors, an ultra high-rise building with marble floors in all the corridors. It looked undeniably luxurious. As we waited there for a while, surprisingly, his mother came out from there. She was humming a tune and skipping. It was not the usual appearance of my mother-in-law. It was not the usual appearance of my mother-in-law, who usually dressed modestly. She used to aspire to be an actress or a model, and there stood a truly beautiful woman. My husband was the first to rush forward. Mom, are you taking me back for you, my work? 
I followed after him. When Sherry saw Dan's face, she started running away. Mom, what are you doing there? Why didn't you come out of this building? He confronted her with questions, but Sherry remained silent, refusing to meet his gaze. My husband continued to press her, his grip on her arm tightening. Mitch, that hurts! I won't run away anymore. Please let go of my arm. As under my husband's strong persuasion, my mother-in-law reluctantly started speaking. I live here. This is my home. The mother-in-law pointed at the luxury apartment building, confirming that it was indeed her residence. Will you be trying to at plans for those? My husband became even more confused, his voice unintentionally raising. As I glanced around, I noticed that people on their commute were looking at us curiously due to the commotion and the proximity to the station. Could we please come inside for now? And then, please tell us everything calmly. We'd like to hear your explanation. She pouted, and Dan was in a state of panic. It was truly a luxurious apartment, with many rooms, a large TV, and a big sofa. It was far better than our own house. Um, can you explain clearly what's going on? It was a lie. It was a lie. Dan looked up at the ceiling and took a deep breath, desperately trying to control himself from shouting. What part was a lie? I was really a victim of fraud. It was terrible. They took all my money. It seemed that her past experience of falling victim to a fraud scheme was indeed true. However, the problem started from there. The mentality of easily obtaining money by deceiving others took hold of her. In the end, how do you explain this? Stan took out the passbook from earlier, where the balance displayed was zero yelim. For prospects back, I've been sending you $1,500 every month, right? I that money now. Sherry let out a sigh. She took a breath and brought the passbook from the back room. In the passbook, there was $30,000. Why you do, Stan? Mom! Was Mark Lenny? I don't understand. Monster Astard. Explain. I start to you guys. Why is there $30,000 in this passbook? And where did the remittance money go? Was In Dan's mind, the monthly remittance of $1,500 covered the rent for the apartment, utility bills, and repayment of debts, with the remaining money used for a modest lifestyle. That was the image of his mother that he had formed. But that mother didn't exist here. It was understandable for him to panic. Well, if I acted poor, you would give me money, right? The mother-in-law's expression changed. It was a face I had never seen before. Cult and ruthless. With her naturally beautiful features. That rundown apartment doesn't suit me. It, since falling victim to the fraud scheme, she'd been hoarding Dan's remittances. The money we sent was immediately withdrawn and deposited into a different account. She pretended to be in financial trouble, making us believe she had no money. She continued to make us send remittances, accumulating that money and spending it extravagantly. The apartment we believed she was living in was just a camouflage. Later, we found out that she would go gambling almost every day and spend the money there. It to add to the surprise, the story about my father-in-law having an affair and getting divorced, which she had been telling us all along, turned out to be a bold-faced lie. The divorce was apparently due to Sherry's promiscuity and reckless spending habits. If I acted poor, my friends would lend me money. You see, I wanted to be an actress. She said it shamelessly, without a hint of remorse. I never imagined Sherry to be this kind of person. Pay back all the money you borrowed from people, and we will collect the rest. Huh. That money is mine. Besides, if I don't have money, I can't live in this apartment. I will never pay it back. Then we will cut ties with you. You have no idea how much we struggle to send you remittances. Enough is enough. Wait, wait. Don't cut ties with me. I promise I'll return all the money. As soon as the words cut ties were mentioned, Cherry immediately panicked. It might be another act, but it seemed like she still wanted to maintain the parent-child relationship with her son. Cherry, please don't think about running away. If you try to escape, we have ways to find you. Just remember my father's profession. I inserted a sharp reminder and Cherry's face turned even paler. In truth, my father is a lawyer. He raised me as a single father, and witnessing his hard work had inspired me to work diligently as well. If Cherry tried to run away, I was truly prepared to consult my father, but I didn't want to burden him with unnecessary work. So I stared at Cherry, giving her my most intense glare. Afterward, Cherry started to repay the money as promised. 
It seems that she had borrowed money from various people. She seemed really distressed and said she didn't have enough money for this month's groceries, so I lent her $100. Was she lying? She said her water supply would be shut off this month, so I gave her $200 to help with her living expenses. Is she deceiving me? Upon learning the true reasons, people were utterly appalled. Nobody seemed to be concerned about Cherry anymore. Instead, they distanced themselves from her. We also decided to keep our distance and stop providing financial support. Sherry now lives in a rundown apartment working part-time. She's on the brink of having her water supply shut off for real. People's personalities don't change that easily, and Sherry continues to have conflicts both at work and in her relationships, often leading to job terminations. She's been moving from one part-time job to another, living an unstable life. Currently, she looks worn out and in poor condition, but it's a result of her own actions. Regarding the incident when Dan yelled at me after seeing the bank book and accusing me of not sending money, he later apologized to me. I'm truly sorry. I'm on the Skyline's connection. They died to you even though you were faithfully, sithfully sending money to my mom. I shouldn't have done that. Indeed, when Dan saw the bank book, he immediately suspected and yelled at me. Oh, it was shocking. What is your suppression? I just heard that it came from his concern for his mother. Although Dan is usually gentle, I didn't resent at all for being able to get angry on behalf of someone important. He truly believed in his mother. It pains me to think about Dan's current feelings, betrayed by his own mother. I am genuinely worried about Sherry living alone in the apartment. However, for the sake of Sherry as well, we had decided to observe from a distance for a while, and we returned to our normal life. The $1,500 that I used to send as support turned into savings, as I had hoped to repay my father and for the future of our child. After several months passed, and the savings started to accumulate, as if in perfect timing, God blessed me with a new life growing inside my belly. I was filled with happiness. I, who used to be so focused on work, decided to quit my job and dedicate myself to childcare. Having witnessed numerous retirements due to marriage at my workplace, I received even more blessings and well wishes from people who saw me off on my retirement. Our child grew healthy and strong, and our family of three with a loving husband and adorable son never ceased to smile. My father seemed incredibly delighted to have a grandchild, and he started visiting our house more often. And are you happy? And are you happy? Then much, oh, a car seats his airy. He always worries about me and says such things. And now, I'm at the airport waiting for Dan, who's going through the boarding process. Sorry to keep you waiting. Shall we go? I'll carry your luggage. Greg, it was a dream trip with my father, a journey abroad with my father, son, and husband. The four of us, to show our gratitude to my father, were about to embark on this trip. Let's go. Grandpa, who come with us? How far they in? I glanced at Dan and exchanged smiles. We left Japan with joy, determined to never betray the smiles of our precious family. Learning from the lessons taught by Sherry, I will always protect the smiles of my family. Is this handmade? Are you making fun of me? Handmade is nothing more than garbage. Who wants this garbage? I gave my sister-in-law Rose handmade baby clothes as a baby shower gift, but she threw them away, calling them less than garbage. I was so frustrated, but I was thinking, while holding back my tears, that I'm sure my brother and sister-in-law will regret it. I am Judy. I'm in my thirties and single. I have two siblings, an older brother Mark and a younger brother Jory. My parents died when Mark was a high school student and Jory was in first grade of elementary. Mr. Our house, because of a contract when my father passed away, we were no longer obligated to pay the mortgage. We were fortunate to be able to continue to live in the house. I think this was really important. My relatives were worried about Jory who was still young. They suggested sending him to an orphanage. But Mark said, I will raise him myself. If I can't do it, don't think about it. He thought he didn't want the three of us to be torn apart, and he couldn't bear to lose any more of his family. I'm so impressed with his great determination. I, on the other hand, am a very shy person. I couldn't talk about my feelings very well when I was a child. Even as an adult, I've not been able to improve. Now, I work from home and live alone in my parents' house. And live alone in my parents' house. That's why I love and cherish that house. It is an old house, so regular maintenance is important as a single person. 
I feel it is my duty to protect it. My brothers have offered to take care of it, but I have refused their offers. I am the only one who pays for repairs. They are married and have moved out of the house. But they live only one station away from me, so we have a lot of interaction in our daily life. We are still good brothers and sisters. Anyway, since they are both married, we can't see each other just for the sake of being brothers. And there was another reason why I couldn't visit him easily. That reason is Mark's wife's. I'm close to Jory's wife, but Rose looks down on me for some reason. Whenever I see her, she always curses at me. So I went to visit them. She immediately started cursing me without saying hello. Oh my god. I can't believe you went to all the trouble to come all the way to our house to deliver such a letter. You must have a lot of time on your hands. When she opened the door, I couldn't possibly get along with her. No, it doesn't mean that I have a lot of time, but I work from home. I tried to resist somehow. What? I don't know what you're talking about. I can't hear you. You're driving me crazy. She said. She said expensive looking jewelry on purpose. You care about that? Well, you can't afford it, can you? I went to see Karen the other day. Unlike you. Karen, she knows my sense of style. She's just like me. She knows what's trendy and what's not. Karen is Jory's wife. It's Karen gets along well with me and her. She works at a clothing store. It's a luxury brand, so she likes it. Rose doesn't have a job. Her jewelry is paid for by Mark's hard work, but he is a saver. He doesn't like fancy things. Either do I. It's not that we don't have the money to afford it. It's a matter of taste. And yet she wears luxury brand clothes and jewelry. It's none of my business, but I'm independent and I've never bothered her at all. So why do I have to be made fun of so often? I really had no idea. But my brother was in love with his beautiful wife. When they got married. I am so happy that my beautiful girlfriend, who is out of my league, chose Mimi. He said so happily. I'm a very shy person, and when I think of my brother, I always hesitate to say something back to him. Have you finished your errands? I'm meeting a friend now, so please leave soon. She was dressed more extravagantly than usual. I can't believe she was dressed like that to hang out with her friend. I bowed my head to tell her I'm done and went home. Even after I got home, I was still bothered by her attitude. I don't know why, but she just has this attitude towards me. But my brother brought me to this point. After my parents died, I was in his debt. He married late because of me and my brother. I want him to be happy. That's what I always wanted. That's why even though I know her other side, I only see her once in a while. I thought it would be okay if I just put up with it. I just had to put up with her attitude. Then my brother and sister-in-law had a baby. But that night, I got a call from Rose. I hesitated for a moment before answering. Maybe it was a thank you call. I had such a faint hope. I answered without being prepared. A gift card? Are you kidding me? Bring me something better. What? I can't believe this is the gift of a newborn. I knew you didn't have any common sense. That's why poor people are useless. You have a niece. You're supposed to get something more expensive. But looking at you, I can't even imagine what he's capable of. She made me buy a gift for the baby. And she also made fun of Mark. I was mad for the first time in my life. I thought I could talk back to her. Just on the phone, I grabbed my cell phone like I was ready to fight back. Hey, you were on the phone. Then I heard Mark's voice on the phone. I was just thanking her for the present, but she said she would bring us another gift. So she asked me what I wanted. I'm so lucky to have a good sister-in-law. Just with that kind of lie, she puts my brother on the phone. Oh, well, don't be too hard on yourself. Must to you come and see me? Is our match in? Damn you kick the problem? I'll come see you when I can. By talking back. I might have robbed my brother of his happiness. I was afraid of that. I want him to be happy. That's all I wanted. A few days later, I went to Rose's house. I was told that Mark would be there today. I was on my way to go there with a peace of mind. Oh, sorry. I got called to work. But please have a good time with him. He said that and left. As I watched his back. I felt a cold stare behind me, and the nightmare began. Rose had received a baby gift from Karen on another day. She bragged about it with satisfaction. She also kept complaining that the gift certificate I gave her was not good enough. Her baby is adorable, but I thought I'd just give her the gift and go home soon. Well, this is... What's this? Did you hear what I said the other day? I gave Rose baby clothes. She made fun of the fact that they were handmade and threw the whole package away in front of me. This is handmade, isn't it? 
Are you making fun of me? Handmade Nate is nothing but garbage. Who wants this garbage? Many words came to my mind to say that. Voiced. But then I remembered Mark's happy voice. I swallowed the words. Instead, tears welled up in my eyes. I hurriedly left the place. She said something went behind my back, but I couldn't listen to them anymore. After that, I was often out of touch with him. Partly because he was busy, but also because I didn't contact him. Then, after a while, I got a call from Mark. Care had given birth to a baby, and he wanted me to go with his wife to celebrate. I wanted to refuse, but Mark thinks I'm good friends with his wife. He said to me, I am worried about letting her go alone with the baby. I want you to go with her. By the way, he and Joy were at work so they were going to meet me later. So I went with his wife to Joy's house to celebrate. Because of the trouble I went through last time, I had prepared a slightly larger gift certificate as a congratulatory gift for Karen. I planned to get baby clothes for Joy's baby, but after the incident with Rose, I changed it to gift card. To be honest, I wanted to leave as soon as I gave her the gift. But my brothers are coming over later, so I can't leave before them. I want them to come as soon as possible. That's what I thought. She kept talking to me on the way. If she doesn't like me, why doesn't she just leave me alone? You didn't bring any homemade baby clothes again, did you? Maybe because there were people there. She kept making sarcastic remarks in a low voice, as if she was mocking me for the rest of the day. I thought she was still looking down on me. I was not in the mood. I was well with these feelings when we got to Joy's house. I saw something I never expected to see. Is this yours? I recognized that because the paper bag was so cute. It was a baby outfit I had made. That day, I gave the baby gift to Mark and his wife. She also visited them to pick up something she'd left behind. She brought it back without thinking. She thought about asking my brother and sister-in-law for permission. She wanted to ask Rose's permission, but Karen thought that something had happened between Rose and me, so she was going to bring it back at the first opportunity. At the first opportunity, I was surprised to see the baby clothes Karen had brought. Begsa Creos, on the other hand, was surprised to see that Karen had brought baby clothes from Rose's place. What are you doing with all this junk? I asked her, and as usual she looked at me like I was an idiot. But the next thing Karen said was, Rose's color changed? What are you talking about, garbage? It's such a waste to throw it away. It's such a luxury item. A luxury item? Right, it's Judy's work. Isn't that what it should be? Karen says that the baby clothes she threw away are trash or luxury items. Rose didn't seem to have caught up with her understanding of that. She wrinkled her forehead. You are a fashionable lady. But didn't you know those baby clothes were luxury goods? I could tell from the paper bag, you know. What? What are you talking about? How can baby clothes be made by such an idiot as to be luxury clothes? You're wrong. You're so wrong. O's laughs. Karen sighs in disgust. Then Karen starts to tell Rose about me. I'm the owner of an online store that sells handmade clothing. Karen pulled out her phone and showed Rose the website I run. Rose turned to me with a startled look on her face. She obviously knew the site existed, but she did not know that I was going to run it. I thought you knew. Rose is shaken by what Karen said, and seems that she can't say she knows now. Well, Rose couldn't say anything. Karen turned to me and said, I heard that Rose didn't want these baby clothes, so I was wondering if I could have them. Rose had thrown the clothes away, and I thought no one would wear them. If Karen wants to use them, I would be more than happy to let her use them. I nodded my head happily. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to receive such a luxurious gift. And she expressed her happiness. Looked unlike Karen. Rosa's face was filled in anger. And then she did the unthinkable. Ones. They were given to me, she said. And then took the baby clothes from Karen. And then took the baby clothes from Karen. Why did you say anything? You say you're just doing some work from home. And you were kind of unemployed. I never said that. Rose just assumed that I was unemployed. I thought so and glared at Rose. What's that look in your eyes? She put her hand to the air. Just then, I heard the front door open. The situation was resolved. I looked at Karen and her eyes locked. And she winked at me. I wasn't sure what to make of it. After that, as if nothing had happened, the baby shower and dinner started. Mark had no idea what was going on. He was happy talking to Rose. I wondered if not saying anything was really for Mark's sake. I was conflicted. In the end, despite my worries, I began to get frustrated with myself for not having done more, and a few days later I got a call from Mark. We just decided to meet for the first time in a long time. At Shin's happy to see him, but it was obvious from the tone of Mark's voice that it was not a pleasant conversation. 
I hadn't seen Mark for a long time. He looked a little tired. As soon as I saw him, I asked, are you all right? Then Mark told me that he was going to divorce his wife. After the baby clothes, Mark had a talk with his wife. Rose opened up and started cursing me. He said he didn't want to say what he wanted to say because he was worried about my feelings. But considering what we'd been through, from Mark's point of view, Mark must have found it unbearable to hear. The reason why Rose started talking about it was, Rose tried to sell the baby clothes she took from Karen. Mark thinks it was a gift from me, so he asked her why she was selling a baby shower gift. But Rose insisted she needed the money. But that wasn't enough to convince Mark. When he asked her about it more, she turned bay. Rose had always been a spendthrift. Mark wanted to give her a comfortable life, so he gave her enough money. So he gave her enough money. But he felt uncomfortable when Rose turned to bay and cursed at me. Then Mark investigated her using a detective agency and chin on her cheating partner. I'm sorry I didn't realize her true nature and caused me pain all these years. I'm sorry too. It's our fault. We delayed your marriage, didn't we? Oh, but you were so happy when you got married. I'm not very good at expressing my feelings. Whenever I try to express my true feelings, I can't help but cry. Mark is like he used to be. He looked at me calmly and listened to me. After saying all that, I wanted you to be happy with your wife. I should have told you sooner. I'm sorry I didn't tell you. When I looked at Mark, he was also crying a little. When I saw that, I knew it was wrong to hold back. I regretted my mistake. Since he was able to talk to me about it, he seemed to have made an even firmer decision to get a divorce. As was when he got home that day, he showed her the divorce papers, along with proof of the affair. Of course, Russ denied the affair at first, and cried and screamed in front of Mark. But from the evidence, she probably thought it would be hard to deny the affair. Finally, she said, I'm not going to let you see our children, etc. But the evidence is all there. There's no way she can get away with this. And since she is estranged from her parents, she was judged as it is hard for her to raise their kids. He would have parental authority. The divorce was finalized. The property was then divided. She still spent all the money she had. And she got into debt. Maybe she acted like she was crying and screaming in front of my brother and... I guess she was not sorry for what she did. But she actually lived in poverty as a little girl. So she had a history of being made fun of. After she grew up, in order not to be made fun of... She became vain. She had hidden it from her brother, but she confessed it to get his sympathy before they divorced. But no matter what she had experienced in the past, what she had done was unforgivable. He didn't feel sorry for her and told me not to worry. For now, I take care of the children while he's at work. When my brother told me about his divorce, I knew he would need a babysitter. I took it upon myself to babysit. At first, my brother was reserved. But then I said... I want to tell your children what you did for me and what you taught me. This time with tears of joy, he was so happy. Because of this incident, I want to be able to express my feelings. I've come to realize that sometimes I have to put things into words to take care of someone I love. To look at this baby girl. I want her to be able to express her feelings and think about the other person's feelings. I want her to grow up that way. In the fresh breeze coming in through the window, looking at her peaceful sleeping face. I wished that the happy memories of this house would continue to grow. I thought to myself, 